Excuse me. Presentation mode and go. This is me. Uh, I've been in Drupal community for quite a while. I do training and consulting. My business is about 50-50. Um, I do something kind of in the middle as well called project coaching. Um, where I, I help development teams just make sure they're using best practices and not falling into rabbit holes of, of bad practices and helping them kind of set things up and um, from a developer workflow standpoint, from a, a custom module standpoint, like what's the best way to do X in Drupal? Um, so a, a lot of what I present on both in this session and other stuff and teach on is stuff that I've actually you know, picked up and learned um, in real world scenarios. So I'm pretty confident that what I'm going to show you today is, is, is solid and not like theoretical, not, not like a theoretical way of doing things, but an actual best practice um, tools and, and tricks on, on how to do this. Um, I'm Ultimike Everywhere. I have a couple long form classes that I teach. Uh, Drupal Career Online is a 12 week, three half day a week, live online. So you meet my little talking head in the box. Um, I, mean, I just started this new thing, which I'm kind of proud of. Um, I'm working with the folks behind DDEV. I do monthly online workshops to get folks up and running with DDEV. So you can go to DrupalEasy.com and, and find you know, more information about all that stuff. All right, so what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to make sure we walk out of here understanding the basics. Not the advanced stuff, not the, you know, I've got this weird edge case situation that I want to, you know, have an answer to by the, you know, by 145 or whatever, but, you know, the basics. Um, and then, you know, I want to have comfort with um, some workflows. And just so you know this, I use a slideshow for a full day workshop and a 45 minute workshop. So we're going to skip some slides. Um, yeah, so those are, you know, the, you know we're really going to focus on that first one. We might, towards the end, uh, be able to play around a little bit and, and actually see some stuff in action. All right, so here's the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway, I think. Um, everybody who's in Fight Club, that's kind of where I stole this quote from. Um, but if you want to use a configuration system, you can't, you know, if you're on a team, you can't use it by yourself. It has to be part of your team's process. Just like if, if you're on a team, you can't be the only one using Git. That's not going to work. Everybody has to be using Git. And you all have to be agreed on how you're using Git. You all have to be agreed on, what, as a developer, what branch am I committing to? So the first rule is to talk about the process. Um, and I'm a, you know, the, the more I do Drupal 8 and the more I, you know, help folks with configuration management, um, the less technical it is and the more about process it is. And we're going to see a lot of that in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so the technical side, I actually don't think the technical side is all that hairy or difficult, and we're going we're to see a bunch of it today. Um, as with most things, the, the hardest part is just defining the process and getting everybody on board and the communication behind the process. Um, the other thing is all or nothing. And it's kind of a double, double meaning with all or nothing, where the configuration system on a technical stand, uh, from a technical standpoint in Drupal 8, when you export or import configuration, you're exporting all of the configuration. Even if you just made one little change, you run a Drush config export, you are taking all of the configuration from that site and exporting it. The same thing with the config import. Even if you only have one little change, you're going to import all of the configuration. So it's all or nothing. So that's one kind of way to look at the all or nothing phrase. The other way is, again, if all of the team members aren't on board with, the, with how you're going to use it, then you might as well not use it. Because you're, if you're the only one who's, you know, if you're going to say, I'm going to start using config system and everyone's going to follow, you're not going to have a great time with that. You're going to you know, be frustrated a lot, I think. All right, so let's, let's talk about the technical side just a little bit. Uh, Drupal database. We all hopefully we know database stores two types of data: your content, right? So you go node, add, basic page, type, 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 type. Hit save. All that stuff goes in the database. That part hopefully we know. And the other half of it, half of it is configuration. And configuration is everything else basically that you do through the Drupal UI. That's not content. So you create a view and save it. That the the, the structure of that view gets stored in the database as configuration. You're creating a content type with 13 fields. The configuration, how you, you know, the widgets and formatters and settings that you selected for each of the fields on that content type, that's configuration. That gets stored in the database. 
So we have two types of data in the database. And you know, for the most part, there's some tables that are content, some tables that are configuration, um, and Drupal 8 even more so. But it's still sometimes, it can be difficult to kind of you know, draw a clear line of sand between the two. Um, so ideally, as a developer, you, know, you want to be working on your local machine. You don't you never want to be making changes directly on production. And I'm going to, um, from a best practice standpoint, I'm going to talk about today how you should not be making any changes on production that aren't related to content. And let's even expand that. You shouldn't be making any changes on any environment other than a local that involve configuration. So you should make changes on local and push up through dev, through you know, your, your, your Git branch environments, your test environments, your QA environments, and onto production. You know, obviously the reason for that is if you're gonna break something, break it locally. And then once you think you have something working, you know, have your, your team's process to push that to a shared dev environment where someone signs off on it. And then pull it into your test environment where your QA folks sign off on it. And then only once it's, it's gone through that process and has multiple eyes and automated testing or whatever your process is, only then do you go to production. And then hopefully it will be a non-event at that point. It will just, you know it will work. <laughs> so I use this slide in almost every uh, class I teach. This kind of, um, you know, it, it, kind of a graphic on um, a, a basic developer workflow, best practices. <laughs> code flowing up. You can see there's the only way to get code into the repository is from a local. So you work locally, and you know, you've got a bunch of developers here, so they work locally. They're allowed to push code up in the repository, but all these other environments, they can only pull. And then on the other side of things, on the, on the database and, and, and uh, the, the database and the files for Drupal side of things, you never want to be taking databases and copying them up. You know, rare cases, maybe you're just starting a project and you need to see you know, this environment because it's a brand new environment. But for the most part, you never want to you know, spend six hours creating content types and views down here and then decide, oh, well, I need to push that to production. Let me just copy my local database up to production. Clearly, that's a bad idea, right? Because you're going to overwrite content. And you know, maybe you can say, well, I can be sneaky about it and pick specific tables out of that database and copy it up. And, you know, it's easier said than done. Right? I don't think anybody would recommend doing that. So we kind of want to keep this in mind that we want, to, um, we want code to flow up and we want data to flow down. Now, based on this and based on one of my first slides, um, where I was talking about how configuration lives in the database, now we kind of have a problem, right? Because if I'm saying that we don't want to um, make changes up here, you know, configuration changes up here or any changes up here, we only want to make them down here, and those configuration changes get stored in the database, well, how do we get those configuration changes that are in the database up when we're not allowed to move up on that side? Well, the graphic you know, gives us the answer. Somehow those configuration changes have to be put into the repository. So the, data, so the configuration changes, you, know, you save a view that's in your database. Somehow you've got to get that configuration out of your database into code so you can push it into your repository and pull it into your other things. And that's what the configuration system does. The configuration system basically takes configuration that's in your database, export it, exports it into files, which then can be committed to your repo. And as files, they can be brought in to various environments. And then once those files are brought into your various environments, then you can do what's called a configuration import, where it takes the configuration from the files and brings them into the database. So we have a, 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 a solid workflow that's going to keep our database intact. It's not going to involve any database copying you know, going on. It's going to you know, have some side benefits as well, where by our configuration changes being in the repository, they're trackable. We know exactly what happened. And we can test them through our processes. We can pull them into here and test them, make sure everything works, and pull them into here and test them, make sure, make sure everything all works, and then finally pull them into production and we're done. So at its heart, the configuration is basically just a way to move configuration from the database into files and then from files into the database. But the processes around all that, that's, that's, the, that's where we really have some work to do. 
Um, yeah, so I talked about how we don't want to copy your database up, and it's not really practical to move specific tables up from local to dev to test to production, so we don't want to do any of that. Um, but Drupal's a configuration system provides us a way to do a config export. And that basically takes, like I said, takes the configuration on the database and moves it into the YAML file. <laughs> and we're going to look at all this in a few minutes. And then we use Git to move it to environments. All right, so this is probably the second most important graphic that we're going to look at. Because this is just kind of breaking down the whole process. So imagine this is your laptop. This is where you do your work. This is what's called, like, this just for, now, for simplicity, like a dev server. So you would get a task, you know, hey Mike, I need to create a new content type. All right, fantastic. I fire in my local environment, I add a new content type, I add all these fields, I test it out in my local, everything looks great. But all of that stuff that I've just done is living in here, is living in my database. And ultimately I want it to be up here in this database. So I clearly, like we talked about, I'm not gonna copy this up. I don't want to have to log into this site and tap, re tap, 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 repeat all my steps because that's error prone, time consuming, tedious, pick your adjective there. So this is what the configuration system is going to allow us to do. We're going to, um, we can do it through the UI. I'm going to, the way I teach it is I you know, teach it using Drush, although Drupal console um, has equivalent commands as well. But we do what's called a Drush config export. And all this does is basically takes the configuration in here and transmogrifies it into a bunch of YAML files. And we're going to, I have an example where we're actually going to see that happen. But then once we're YAML files, then we can do our git add and our git commit so we get them into our local repository. At this point, we can do a git push to the remote git repository. And then we can do a pull to get those files into our, onto our dev server. At that point, we're not done because Drupal's reading configuration out of here, but the new configuration is only here. So we have to do a config import to basically take all that configuration and transmogrify it into the database. And once it's in the database, then it's, it's your active configuration. And there you go. So this is kind of the, the process. You know, this is, again, this is a, a basic process. There's some modules that allow you to do some other things with this. But for now, for kind of an intro 101 class, like this is going to be our session, um, this is kind of a pretty solid diagram of, of, of what that basic process looks like. So here's where the rubber really hits the road. I actually think I have a slide that says rubber meets road, so I kind of jumped the gun on my, on my analogy. Um, if you're going to use a configuration system, it has to be part of your team's process. Not just your process, but your team's process. Um, and the reason why is because we've been trained, hopefully, to when we sit down to work on a new task, and we fire up our local development environment, what's the first thing that we should be doing? We should be making sure our code is up to date. We do a git pull. We make sure if any other, anybody else made changes, we get those changes. So we're used to doing that. Well, if we're going to start using the configuration system, we need to also get in the habit of, after we do a git pull, we have to do a git config import. And based on that previous slide, the reason for that should be obvious. Right? Because some other developer may have made a configuration change and push it into the repo. So we have to make sure that if a developer committed a change, we pull it in. Not only from a code standpoint, but also now from a configuration standpoint. So this is kind of where muscle, we have to start developing muscle memory. This is where a process is so important and everybody on the team has to be on board. Because if you have a five person team and three people are doing this and two people aren't, you will lose configuration. It will poof. Well, it'll be in the repository somewhere, but it will get overwritten pretty darn easily. Everybody has to be on board with this. The same thing, when you are done working on a task, you're used to doing your git add, git commit, git push. Well, we have to start pairing that up with a config export. Unless you know that all you've done is change a, a line in SAS to change you know, a font size or something. If you've done any configuration on your local site at all, before you do your git add, you're, you're going to need to do a config export. Because that configuration change, you have to start thinking in your head, okay, that's really a code change. And if I need to capture that code change, I need to do a config export to turn it into code. 
So I do my git config export, then I do my git add commit push, so that the config change goes along for the ride. No, this is all I'll say. The animation is not what I expected, so I think that's the last one. Ah, there we go. All right, so uh, kind of like a summary so of, uh, of kind of the process. You know, when you sit down and start a task, you're used to doing git pull, or I do a git pull dash dash rebase, and right after, you want to config import, just to make sure you have other people's configuration changes, changes reflected on your local. When you finish a task, you know, do your config export to make sure that any config changes you made get captured as code, and then you can do your git add commit and push, and get them up there. And this even extends to changing branches, right? Because when you change a branch, you're changing your code base. And one of the changes in your code base might be in that configuration, in, in a configuration file. So when you get check out my branch, your very next step should be to drush config import. So this is why it's so important that it becomes part of your developer process. All right, so let's get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts here. Uh, I've been talking about these magical configuration files, but where, where are they? Where, where do they go? Well, um, you can specify where they end up um, by, you know, uh, in your settings.php, let me see there. There we go. You can configure in your settings.php file where this magical sync directory is. If you use the um, Drupal Composer, uh, I always forget, Drupal Project, Drupal Composer template, did I get it right? I know it's those three words and some words like tacos, you know, <laughs> ingredients in different order. The standard kind of Drupal Composer template that for Drupal 8 that a lot of folks use. Um, it's automatically configured for you uh, above the doc root in a folder named config. You know, very reasonable place and that's kind of what I'll be showing you in a few minutes. Um, you can move, move it around if you want, but most people don't. Um, and I talked earlier about hey, it has to be all or nothing. And the reason why the config system works all or nothing is because configurations have dependencies on one another. And it's really easy to see when you start thinking about an entity or a content type with fields. Right? Because you have a content type and you can configure the content type. It has a name, it has what the default values for published are, it has what you call the title field and stuff like that. So that's kind of the metadata of the content type. But then the content type has fields. So each field has their own configuration. How, you know, what's, how, you know, is it multi-valued or not? Is it required? That's on the field level. But then each field, you know, on the manage display page, you can pick a formatter. So each formatter has its own configuration. And then each field on the form display also has a widget that you select. And those are all different configurations. But clearly, the configuration for a widget depends on the configuration for the field, which can, depends on the configuration for the content type. And then imagine if you have a view, that depends on that content type. So these configurations are highly dependent on one another. And it becomes very, very difficult um, to, to say, okay, well, I only want to export this thing, and then ask Drupal to say, you figure out what all the dependencies are. It's possible, but it's, it's not feasible at this time to do something like that. So rather than tackling that kind of hairy, it's like dependency manager problem is what it is, but rather than tackling that, you know, the decision was made that it's going to be all or nothing. When you export configuration, you, you're not going to, unlike features in Drupal 7, so I asked about features, unlike features in Drupal 7 where you pick and choose what gets exported, when you do a config export, everything, all, everything goes. When you do config import, everything. And the, you know, one of the main reasons for that is to avoid this whole, this, depend, this, this configuration is dependent on this one, it's dependent on this one, and that one, that whole you know, nightmare of a dependency graph. So if you just do a standard install of Drupal, download Drupal core, run this installer, um, and then do a config export, there's over 170 different configuration files. So we don't want to be managing that, we want Drupal to be managing that for us. Um, not recommending to export import subsets of those files for the dependency issue, um, all or nothing. All right, so let's do a live demo here, and then da, 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 let me just go. Okay, so this is for the long form, but I want to get to 
There we go. Okay, so I'll come back to that in a few minutes. All right, so a little bit of setup. Because it, it, um, I can't push and pull to, re, to a remote. To a, to a, I, this is actually set up to work with the Pantheon remote um, because I, a SSH port is blocked. So what I've done is I have my local site, my local, and it's actually, oh, this one's not air quotes, this one's actually local. Um, um, and it's got the green bar. Okay? And then I actually have a. I have a remote, this one's actually air quotes, a remote Git repository. Is that zooming in? Yeah. This is like, uh, come on, go away. This is my remote Git repository. I just stuck in my downloads directory. And then, so I pulled a second site from that repository that's also a local. But this one's a, I'm gonna call this one a local with air quotes. It has the red. So the idea is we're gonna pretend that this is a remote dev environment. The red is the remote. This is my local. And the idea is that we're going to play on the local for a minute here. Um, but eventually, we're going to make a configuration change on the local. And then we're going to push it to the dev. And we're going to kind of watch that process from a standpoint of this diagram right here. All right, but before we do that, let's go and look just a little <laughs> tiny bit of code. So if we go into, let me make sure I'm on the right site, pretty sure I am. If we go into the settings.php, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, no, that's right, let's see. Come down here. Oh no, is it local, where is it? Which one did I put this one in? I feel like I'm on the wrong site all of a sudden, but that's okay. There we go, okay. No, this is... Hang on, sorry about this. I thought I had everything all set. Let me just make sure that I'm pointing at the right place. That's what I'm looking for. Something's like PHP. Oh, it is right there. It's there the whole time. No, it was there the whole time and I just missed it. Okay. So this is inside my settings.php and this is where you specify where um, the config send directory goes. Um, so this is what you get out of the box when you use the composer template, the Drupal project, Drupal composer template. I'm basically it's saying that the config send directory um, lives you know, on the Drupal root, or the, the directory name that the Drupal root is in. So this is the root above, this is the directory above the Drupal root inside the config directory. So this basically corresponds to, if this is my project directory, this is my Drupal root inside of web. So this config directory is where my exported <coughs> configuration files are gonna end up. And ultimately, I'm gonna commit these files and push these files around. Right now it's empty, other than the HTSS file for production. Okay, so let's go ahead and, you know, we're gonna pretend that this is a brand new site and I've never used a configuration system before. So we're gonna come over to, um, well actually let's just do it this way. Let's just go right to here and I'm gonna do it. I'll just get into the machine. Big enough. So our first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do a drush config export. So we have our site up and running. It's pretty lame, but it does have a name. Um, all of the configuration for the site that's here. So we're going to do a drush config export and kind of get all that configuration from here into files. So that's all Drush config export does. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, on this in a minute, exactly how that works. So you can see successfully exported to slash config. So we can come over to here and now look inside and see all of the configuration files. So the really kind of interesting thing about this is, 
So let me open this up in the uh, um, database editor real quick. All of the configuration in Drupal 8 is stored in one table. Config. And it's a really simple table. There's really, for the, most of the time, there's only two uh, columns that are used. The name of the configuration and then the actual configuration data itself. And if we look at this, we see there are 181 rows in this table. When we do a configuration export, all Drupal does is go through each row, creates a new file called, in this case, automatedcron.settings.yaml, takes the data, converts it from JSON to YAML, and writes it to the file. So configuration export is kind of a, a, a really simple little thing. And if we come here, automatedcronsettings.yaml, and there are the settings now in, in um, YAML and not JSON. So config export is kind of just like the simpler of the two processes. It literally just reads this table, exports it to files. Nothing more. So at this point, we're, we're over here. So let's kind of do the right thing. And let's do a git status. And we're going to see all this stuff. Git add config. Git commit dash n initial configuration. Ah. There we go. Git status and git push. And I, I have to do this exact same um, uh, fake remote repository last time at Batcamp last year. So that's why I named my remote repository Batcamp, if anybody's wondering. So I'm going to push to that kind of local remote repository. Well, local remote, that makes a lot of sense. Um, local repository over there, and I'm going to come over here. So this is now my dev site, and I'm going to do a git pull dash dash rebase. And so just so you can see, there's nothing up my sleeve. If I come over uh, here, config is empty. This is my dev. And if I do my git pull dash dash rebase, all the files are there. Okay, so it's probably a good idea since we did actually, you know, we've done our pull. You know, we did our push. We just pulled into here. But now we're, we're in this weird place where, you know, the active configuration is here. We just pushed new configuration to here. But theoretically, since it's a brand new site and since I set it up this morning, I'm pretty positive the configuration that we started with here is identical to the configuration here. So there should be no differences between this and this. But we can check that by going to our remote site and going to the configuration synchronization page, part of Drupal core, and it will tell us if there's any changes. And there's no configuration changes. So that basically tells us that as of this moment, the configuration of our local site is identical to the configuration of our dev site. And that just kind of gets us seated. That gets everything kind of set up and ready to roll for the process. So now let's actually make a change. So let's come to our, you know, we want to follow best practices. And our best practices, we don't make changes on remote machines. Code configuration. It's kind of an extreme best practice when it comes to configuration, but it's a good We'll talk about a little bit why it's, it, it can really be helpful. So we're going to make a small configuration change down here and then push that up using the configuration system. How am I in time? Okay. So we're going to make the simplest of configuration changes. We're going to come here and add a slogan. That is super exciting. <laughs> so say hello, Astro. Come here and save it and come to the home page. Now let's dive into this tiny little configuration change a little bit. Let's go look at our database first. Um, if you scroll down, there is a system.site. Uh, let me refresh, otherwise you're going to be a liar. And then we'll look at the data. And I know it's not a whole lot to see here, but there is, sure enough, in there, hello Asheville. 
So that configuration change that we just made through the UI got saved to the database in the config table in this configuration row for system.site. So at this point, on our local site, we can go to that same config same page. Because what have we done? We've made a change in the configuration. We've changed this configuration in here. We haven't touched this yet. So for that system.site configuration, there's a difference between this and this. Hello Asheville's in here, hello Asheville's not in here. So this configuration sync page on our local should reflect that. And so one of my tips and tricks is ignore anything in yellow on this page. Just ignore it. This is all that matters. And sure enough, we have one change. And it's in the thing we, we hope. And I've got a couple of beefs with uh, the Drupal 8 configuration system. Uh, probably the top of the list is the way that these labels appear, because I think they're actually counterproductive to understanding what the configuration system is doing here. Um, active here in your head, translate this to database. This is what's in your database. And you know, active is technically correct because it is the active configuration, but this is what's in the database right now. Staged, translate this into this is what's in your configuration directory. So you can, if you want, you can go database files. So in our database, we have the slogan. In our files, we have no slogan. And that's correct. The other kind of, I don't want to use the word misleading, but I'll, I'll use the word confusing thing about this page is, you know, this word right here, it's not too bad here, but when you add a new configuration, like if you add a new um, a content type or new view, if you add a new view to local, that will actually come underneath a one removed heading, which is counterintuitive because I just added a view, why is it in the removed section? And so the way to translate what we see here is, you know, these verbs right here, these adjectives, um, I look at them as, this is what's gonna happen if I hit this button. If I hit this button, this one is gonna change. If I hit this button, then that new view is going to be removed. So it's a little bit confusing. If we have time, we'll do an example where we see that add remove stuff. But um, this import all button is our config import. I'm not going to use the button. I'm going to do it all through Drush, but it's technically the exact same thing. But we're going to do it through Drush, but we're not quite there yet. All right, so we've made a change here. We know that there's a difference, but we just saw it on the same page. But we want to get that change. We want to codify that change so we can push it up through our process. So to codify it, we have to run config export on our local. So I'm going to come back to my local, and I'm going to do Click back into my web container. And I'm going to do a drush config export. And it knows, it says, hey, whoa, you've got something, you've got one that's changed, and that's the one that we expect. Are you sure you want to do it? Because you're going to change a file? Yeah, sure we do. So we do that. Oops. We do get status, sure enough, we have a configuration change. So our change, sure enough, the old file had no slogan, the new can, you know, system, site.system.yml has our slogan. So we can do our git add config, git commit dash n, added slogan, Git push bad camp master. All right, so we've made our change. We've exported to files. We've done our add and commit locally. You now we've just pushed it to our remote. So now let's go to our remote and pull that one in. So we pulled it in, and you can see there was a fast forward. We had one change on system.site, exactly what we expected. So now we are here. So now our slogan has made it all the way here. It hasn't made it into the database yet. 
And because it hasn't made it into the database, we're not going to see it here. No matter how many times you clear caches, it's not going to appear here because it's not in the active configuration yet. If we go to the config sync page here, hopefully you're going to know, you kind of expect what we're going to see. Again, ignore the stuff in the yellow because it's counterintuitive. Um, we now have, we have a difference in this one, right? Because, keep going on the wrong slide. Because our slogan is here, but our slogan is not here. So that configuration synchronization page is comparing these two and it's going to show us the differences. So again, we can view those differences and we see in the database, we don't have a slogan. But in the file, we do have a slogan. So everything's going according to plan so far. We could do import all right here, but I'm going to stick with doing it from the command line. Let's do clear, drush, config, import. And this is going to take all of the configuration in that directory on the dev server and bring it into the database. Are you sure you want to do that? Yep. Let's do it. Synchronize. Now this is a little bit more serious. Config export's easy. Just loop around all the rows in the table and stick in a file. That's easy. Config import, this, this, is, this is the one doing all the work. For this change, pretty darn easy. But imagine if on your local you've added four new modules. Let's say you've added panels and C tools. And I don't know what else. Um, and you've created some views. And you've placed those views in some panels. You know, when you create a new panel, that's configuration. When you create a new variant inside the panel, that's configuration. So there's a lot of configuration there. So when we do this config import, when we do all that stuff on our local and export all of that config, when we get to the config import, you know, before we did this, you know, in our little make-believe panels situation, panels wasn't even enabled on the dev server. We do a config import, and config import is, it's enabling modules, it's creating panel pages, it's updating views. Config import has to do a lot of stuff. So config import is quite a bit more complicated than what config export is doing. Um, I believe we did that now, so let me exit out that. And we should be able to come here and see that we're all synced up, right? And we should all be synced up because our configuration was here. We just imported it here. So by definition, we kind of copied one to the other so they better be identical at this point, which they are. Which means if we go to the home page, we have our, our slogan on our dev site. So really super simple example, but you know, an example that kind of demonstrates the whole process. All right, let me take a breath. Questions? Yes? How do you deal with configuration templates? Yes. Well, that's not within these 45 minutes, but I'll talk about it a little bit. Cool. All right, so I, when I teach the, the full class, the, the full day class, um, I recommend if you're new to the configuration system, uh, at least to start with, use a module called config read only. And as a developer, you will love config read only. Some of your stakeholders will hate config read only. That's what makes it awesome, right? But what config read only does, and I, I actually have it, um, do I have it enabled? We'll, we'll wrap up, we'll, we'll do config read only since you asked about it. What config read only does is it locks down configuration on the environments of your choice. Meaning you can make it so it's impossible for someone to change configuration on the production machine. Which can be a little bit scary as a stakeholder because things like block placement are configuration. So we're basically telling you know, stakeholders you're not allowed to move that block up one position on production. If you want to move that block up one position, it has to go through the process. It has to be done on local and pushed up through the process. You can get away with that some. Sites can't get away with it without, with others. But there's a little bit of a middle ground, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. So um, config read. Uh, there we go. So let me enable it. 
So I'm enabling it on local. It's config change, so we're going to push this up to remote here in a second. There's two parts to config read only. Part one is actually enabling it, which we're doing. Part two, because if you just enable the module, like on local, and it actually locked you out, then you would not be able to disable it through the UI. You have to go through Drush. So you can enable the module, but then for it to really have teeth, where am I? Uh, wrong site. For it to really have teeth, you have to enable it in your settings.php. So what I just did right here is I'm enabling it. This is on my dev site. So I'm enabling the module on my local, and I'm going to export that config and push it up to the remote. On my local, I'm going to leave this commented out, but on the dev site, I'm going to expose this line of code so that the dev site will be remote. And this is, you probably do see how this is answering your question, because it's eliminating the possibility for a conflict. Well, it's eliminating the, conf the, the, the possibility for a conflict between a local and a remote, but you still have the potential for a conflict between me as a developer and you as a developer. Okay, so we did that, we did that. So that's configuration change. Let's just go through that process. We'll speed through this one. What time does sessions end? Is it the top of the hour or quarter? Okay, quarter. Okay. All right, so now. Okay, let's go. All right, so real quick, so when you enable a module that changes core extension, so you can see you just basically you get a, a new line in your database that's saying the zero is the weight, so it's not zero, one, on off. If it's listed, it's enabled. So let's just do this one super fast. So we're going to do a, let's just not do it this way, ddev exec drush configuration export. Get status, get add conf config, get commit dash, and enable config read only, get push, bad, bad camp master. All right, so we've exported, committed, pushed. So let's pull it in over here, get pull dash dash rebase. I must, oh, my settings file had changed. Okay. Git status, git add websites default settings.php. Oh, actually, I don't want to do that. Well, here, I'm going to stash it for now. What I really should have done, and I actually haven't commented out somewhere else, is I basically have it, the, other, the demo I normally do is I have it inside an if statement, so if it's on Pantheon, then it's read-only. So, but, where am I? Did I, did I do it on the wrong one? I thought I, did you just stash it or just? Oh, did I just stash it? <laughs> Right. <laughs> Where'd my change go? Okay. Exact. Uh, drush config import. So I'm basically by doing this import, I'm enabling that module on my dev site. All right, and then we'll do a git stash apply to get my change back. So I just describe this to my clients as training wheels with the config system. Because if we come to any form now on the dev site with config read only enabled, you're not allowed to save any form. This button is grayed out. You know, it doesn't matter what you go to. If you go to like, uh, the weird part is, you know, some of them is a little, some of them are a little bit counterintuitive. If you go to administration, 
you know, this is actually a page, so you can you can't really you can move stuff around, but you won't be able to save it. Um, but each of these are not configurations, so you can actually come in here and change the weight, and that's because the menu link is content. So it's a little bit of a gray area between configuration and content in some places. But um, I, with any of my clients, I try and get away with using config read only. Because especially when I'm on a team with, of developers who are new to config, the config system, it's a good way to get used to the system and take away some of the risk of overriding configuration. Um, and, you know, kind of the byproduct of that is it, you know, it enforces your process. It makes it so that if you want to change, it's got to go through, you know, the developer and go through the, your QA process to make sure that change isn't going to break anything. So that's one kind of the, the nice side effects of using config read only is enforcing your process. All right, let me wrap up the slides. We'll get out of here. If anybody's any questions, I will hang out. All right, so I'd say, you know, when possible, use config read only. Um, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, I call it, it's like training wheels. It's a good way to get started with the config system and, and, and lower your risk. Um, if you're not, you're not using config read only and someone make changes in a remote environment, then there needs to be a process in place to get that config change into Git as soon as possible. So, you know, if you're going to leave it open to config changes and when someone does it, they need to open up a ticket and say, hey, I've changed this view. Can someone get that into the config system? Um, this goes back to changing your individual process. Before working, do your git pull, but then do a git config import. When working with multiple branches, when you do a git checkout of some new branch, right after your checkout, do a config import. And before you, um, if you've made changes to that branch, do a config export to make sure any config changes you made to that branch get captured as well. Um, this is when you make a configuration change and you're running your git commit message. I didn't do it here. I failed on one of my own tips and tricks. I usually prepend every all of my git commit messages with the word config. So when I review my history, I can tell which ones involve a config change. <laughs> and <laughs> that yellow warning text on the configuration synchronization page, I spent way too many hours trying to figure out why it's generated the way it is. It makes zero sense to me. So ignore that yellow text, that, that warning text, and just pay attention to the one changed, one added, one removed, and make sure that those changes correspond to what you think was changed. And that's it. <sighs> Any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm six minutes over, so I'm going to wrap up here. I'll head out in the hallway towards the common area. If anybody's any questions, find me. Otherwise, thank you very much.